Good morning, everybody. I think it's 10 o'clock now, um, so we can make a start, or maybe we'll give people a couple of minutes to trickle in. Can I just check first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you well, so. Okay, Loud thank you. Brilliant. And uh, can I make sure that the slide you're seeing is a full screen slide and not the presenter view? Yep, see the full proper presentation slide. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, let's see how many people we have and then I'll decide whether to get going or give it a couple more minutes. I'll give it until, should we say three past, just because we're expecting a few more. You're very welcome to have your camera on or off for the presentation, totally up to you. Um, obviously I'll have mine on. Um, if you could please mute your microphone, I'd be really grateful for that just so we don't get any extra noise or feedback or anything like that. And then towards the end of the presentation, well at the end of the presentation I should say, um, we can do questions and answers so you can um, turn your camera back on, turn your microphone on and ask questions that way or I'll try to see if I can see the chat. I'll check that now. I don't know whether I'm able to see that. Yes, I can see that. Okay, cool. So yeah, you can, uh, you, at the end of the presentation, you can ask questions through your microphone or through the chat, and I'll try and make sure I'm picking up on all of those. So for those of you who are just joining, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes um, to let a few more people join and then I'll get started. Okay, that makes it three past by my clock, so I'm going to get going. Um, thank you so much for coming, especially on a Monday morning, probably feeling a bit kind of foggy headed, leery eyed. If you're anything like me, you certainly are. Um, I spent the weekend sanding the bedroom floor, so I kind of feel like I could do with another weekend. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll make it. We'll get through this week together. Um, so yeah, my name is Sam. I'm um, UK Science Programme Manager for Cruelty Free International. Uh, let me figure something out a sec. There we go. No, that's not how I change. That's how I change my slides. Okay. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the rat list, which is five animal tests that could end immediately in the UK. Now, before I get started, just in case anyone's joined since I said this, um, just a bit of housekeeping. You're very welcome to have your camera on or off during the talk, totally up to you. 
Um, if you could please mute your microphones, that would be really helpful. And then when we when I get to the end of the talk, we can do questions and answers. Um, so at that point, you can turn your microphone back on and ask a question verbally, or you're very welcome to ask a question in the chat as well. And I'll try my best to keep up with chat questions. Um, so what did I want to say? Other housekeeping. Ah, yes, this is being recorded. Um, and it's it's basically so that we can share this presentation with people who weren't able to attend today, um, just so you're aware of that. Okay, let's get started about the rat list. Oh, well, let's get started about Cruelty Free International to begin with. So just to let you know a little bit about the organisation that I work for, Cruelty Free International is the leading organisation working to end animal experiments worldwide. And we do this by creating a world where nobody wants or believes we need to experiment on animals. We achieve this through campaigning, political lobbying, conducting undercover investigations, and offering scientific and legal expertise to governments, regulators, and companies. Originally a British organization, we've been established for over a century, and we now work in Europe, the Americas, Asia, and Australia, as well as the UK. We're the lead member of Cruelty Free Europe, which is a network of European animal protection groups, and we participate in the International Councils on Animal Protection in OECD and pharmaceutical programmes. We're probably best known for the Leaping Bunny programme, which is our cruelty-free certification scheme that we run for cosmetics and household products. So today's talk is about the rat list, and I'm going to start by telling you about what the rat list actually is. Then we'll go on to how we use the rat list and finally future plans for the rat list. So rat list simply stands for replace animal tests list. It's a non-exhaustive list of animal tests that are still conducted despite having valid accepted replacements. We identified tests to include in the rat list by looking at official figures on animal use for scientific purposes. So basically the GB animal use stats and comparing these with sector specific regulatory requirements and guidelines. So the tests on the list are all regulatory, meaning that they're required by law and often, oftentimes they're used for establishing the safety of things like medicines, chemicals, medical devices, plant protection products. So they're those kind of like typical safety tests you might think about when you think of animal testing, as opposed to basic or applied research. The tests on the UK rat list use an estimated 80,000 animals each year, and that's in the UK alone. So these are our five UK rat list tests. And of course, since animal use figures and legislative requirements vary between regions, the rat list for one region isn't necessarily applicable to another. So this is a UK specific list, but we also have an EU rat list, which has 10 tests on it. And five of those tests actually didn't make it onto the UK list because they're thankfully no longer conducted here. And that includes things like eye irritation, pyrogenicity and shellfish toxin testing. So in some ways, the UK is doing quite well. We, we are a bit of a leader in the sense that we no longer do certain tests that sadly other countries still do. But we really want to see these five remaining tests become history in this country and elsewhere. When there's an animal test that has an accepted non-animal replacement, it's not acceptable that it's happening at all. So I'll go through the five tests in a bit more detail. Starting with number one on the list, skin irritation. So this is a test that's conducted on rabbits um, in the UK. It used 18, well, sorry, it didn't use 18 rabbits. There were 18 uses um, of rabbits in skin irritation tests in 2021 which is the most recent year for which we have numbers. Um, and in the UK, this test is only used for medical devices, which is a bit different from the EU, for example, where skin irritation is still used for things like chemicals. So in the animal method, a test substance is applied to the rabbit shaved skin and held in place with a bandage for a few hours before the rabbit skin is examined for signs of damage and irritation for up to 14 days. Um, if there are no signs of irritation, the test doesn't stop there. Two more rabbits are used then in a, in a test to sort of confirm those results. Rabbits suffer because they're singly housed. And these are social creatures who obviously like interacting with their friends and they have to be housed by themselves 
for the duration of the test. And of course, they can also suffer from painful skin reactions and rashes if the substance is an irritant. The replace, well, there are a few replacement methods actually, but the main replacement method, which is the re reconstituted human epithelium model, um, has been around for over a decade. And these models can be used to predict irritation in humans with more accuracy than the rabbit test. Number two on the list is skin sensitization. And in the UK, this test is conducted only on mice. Again, in other regions, this is a bit different, and the guinea pig test is actually way more prevalent in places like the EU. But in the UK, just mice. Um, there were 357 uses of mice in this test in 2021, and it was used for chemicals, foods, and food contact materials, which again is a bit different from other regions. So in the animal method, the substance is applied to the ears of mice every day for three days, before the mice are killed and their ears are dissected to look for signs of a reaction, a skin sensitization reaction. The replacement method involves using several chemical, computer, and cell based tests together in combinations known as defined approaches, um, which were formalized in a guideline in 2021. Wait, was it 2021? Let me just double check. Yeah, 2021. Sorry, I can't see that corner of my screen. Um, so these tests actually also predict human reactions with greater accuracy than the animal tests. So they're kind of better in every way imaginable. Number three on the list is um, Botox batch potency. Now I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this at this point because I'm focusing on this a little bit later in the talk um, and I'm gonna go into way more detail then. So let's leave it there for Botox and move on to antibody production, number four on the list. So this is a little bit different from other tests on the list because it's not exactly a test, it's more a method of routine production for producing a product, i.e. antibodies, that then go on to be used in tests. And it uses a wide variety of species, including um, mice, rabbits, sheep, and goats. There were over 27,000 uses in the UK in 2021, this is a, a real estimate. Um, we don't really know the numbers because uses for antibody production are categorized under a lot of different kinds of uses in the official statistics. So it could be many, many more uses than this. Um, it's almost certainly not fewer. So in the animal method, animals are injected with a substance that stimulates their immune system to produce the antibodies before their blood, spleen cells, or abdominal fluid are taken to harvest the antibodies in question. They can often suffer from harmful side effects and they're killed when they're no longer useful, which is kind of a given for all of these tests, unfortunately. The replacement method, or the main replacement method is phage display technology. And this can be used to produce a wide range of antibodies that are better quality, more stable, more relevant, more consistent than those produced in animals. And they can also be much faster and cheaper to produce, especially when the technology becomes more established and more widely used. There was actually a 2020 report from the EU Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, or Ural ECFAM, that found that there's no scientific reason for animals to still be used in the development and production of antibodies. And it's been identified by various organisations, including the UK's NC3Rs, that the reasons for continuing to use animals for antibody production are cultural and practical. And then finally, number five on the rat list is veterinary vaccines batch safety. Now, this is a bit of an unknown. We're waiting for a report from the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. Um, it was meant to come out last year, potentially even the year before. So it's quite late at this point, but it will really give us some good insight into how animals are still used in these kinds of tests. So we don't really know which species. We don't really know how many. The reason that a puppy is on the slide is because the last report we had from the VMD um, showed that young animals, including puppies and kittens, were used in these tests. So in some of the animal tests, including the target and laboratory animal batch safety tests, animals are injected with various doses of a vaccine and then they're observed for at least two weeks to see whether they have a reaction to the vaccine. So they can have a painful reaction on the rare occasion that the batch is contaminated. 
and they can also be given very large injection volumes relative to their size, especially if young animals are used. So this can cause pain at the injection site too. There isn't a replacement method as such, it's more that improvements in manufacturing processes have made the animal batch test redundant. So analytical tools, cell-based tests, both help to establish a product profile for each vaccine batch. And then this is used to see whether this batch is consistent with previously tested batches. So what's the significance of the rat list? Why are we focusing on these tests? Well, in the UK, there's a legal requirement to comply with the principle of replacement, which is that wherever possible, a scientifically satisfactory method or testing strategy not entailing the use of protected animals must be used instead of a regulated procedure. It's therefore not only unjustified to do these animal tests when there are accepted replacements, it's also unlawful. If the principle of replacement was properly implemented, the rat list wouldn't exist. The rat list really demonstrates that this is just not happening as it should. We also feel that ending the use of these tests is something that almost everybody could get behind, regardless of their um, stance on animal testing. There's absolutely no risk of lowering safety standards when there's a ready to go clear replacement for a test. And as I showed you before, there's a significant number of animals to be saved, tens of thousands, if we can end the use of the, these tests. I also wanted to just take the opportunity to draw your attention to this report from the NC3Rs. Um, it came out earlier this year, and it, it looked at the processes that are meant to safeguard against animal tests taking place where replacements are available, amongst other things, but this was one of the focuses. So it did look a lot of, at the kind of research that takes place in universities, which of course isn't as relevant to our rat list test because a lot of these are regulatory. But some of the findings, I think, are really, really pertinent to the rat list, and they're just worth being aware of if you're kind of active and interested in this field. So, for example, one of the quotes from the report is that replacement does not seem to be covered well by any of the review processes, meaning that any of the kind of checks and balances that are in place that are meant to make sure that an animal test doesn't take place where a replacement is, is available, they, they're not really working properly. So animal tests are likely taking place where non-animal replacements could be used instead. They found that AWERBs and ASRA inspectors, which are two of the um, groups of people who are meant to be making sure replacements are used where possible, rarely suggest the use of replacements. And it found that reasons for slow uptake of three hours and advances included, included lack of published data on how results using replacement technologies compare to established animal models, and interestingly, concerns about acceptance by the regulator, which is something that we come, come across time and time again. Um, so companies not necessarily wanting to do animal tests, but doing them because they believe that that's what the regulator wants and that's what the regulator will ask for. So there's the web address at the bottom, definitely worth checking out in your own time um, if you're able to. So let's move on to how we use the rat list. So primarily we use the rat list to understand the problem. So for each rat list test where possible, we identify the sectors that are responsible for the test. So for example, is it chemicals? Is it medicines? Is it med medical devices? And we also look at the origin of the regulatory requirement as in, is it coming from within the UK or outside of the UK? So I don't know if, um, if you're all aware of this, but I think it's kind of shocking that um, in the UK, sometimes animal tests will be licensed where they're required by an overseas regulator, even if they wouldn't be required by the equivalent UK regulator. Um, and this is something that, that is kind of openly allowed to happen. Um, finding out these things is actually trickier in the UK than the EU because we have really comprehensive statistics, but unlike the EU, we don't have any way of kind of selecting multiple filters at once. So the EU has this really neat database called Allures, where you can go on a website and you can say, I want to see how many rabbits were tested on in 2020 um, in, say, an acute toxicity test to meet the requirements of veterinary medicines legislation. And you can select all those filters at the same time and it will tell you exactly how many. Um, or I should say how many uses, not how many rabbits. Um, but we don't have anything like that yet in the UK. Hopefully we will in the future. 
So once we have this information, we conduct research to figure out the main reasons for why the tests are continuing. And in most cases, this is lack of global harmonization, as in an overseas regulator is requiring something that the UK wouldn't necessarily require. It could be an unclear regulation or guideline that's not making it obvious that the company or whoever's conducting the test can use the non-animal method. It could be a lack of enforcement from the regulator or from the authorities. So a non-animal method should be being used, but no one's actually policing that. Or it could be a lack of sector or product specific validation. So the non-animal method is available, but the validation exercise to ensure that it's valid for a particular product or sector hasn't been carried out. This is a bit of a controversial one because um, I think a, a kind of specific validation exercise for every sector or product isn't necessarily the way forward and it's often used as an excuse um, not to use the non-animal method. But anyway, I'll leave it at that for validation today because it's a whole can of worms. So as I said before, we're going to go into a bit more detail about Botox testing, just to really illustrate how we use the rat list. So uh, there were 50, uh, around 56,000 uses of mice in Botox testing in 2021. Um, just so you're aware, we're, this isn't an absolute figure, this is an assumed figure. We don't know specifically how many there were because this information isn't recorded but we assume that all batch potency tests on mice that are done to meet the requirements of human medicines legislation are done for Botox testing. And in previous years, we've been able to find an exact figure and it's been very similar to this figure. So we're fairly confident in it. Um, so the animal test is a really, really horrible test. Um, it's very severe. It has death as the expected endpoint in a proportion of animals. So mice are injected with botulinum toxin um, to measure its potency. And the expected outcome is that the mice become paralyzed or a proportion of the mice become paralyzed and they die because their respiratory muscles stop working and they suffocate. It uses tens of thousands of animals each year, as I said, so that's a lot of suffering. Um, one of the issues with Botox that I feel like I should address is that while it does have genuine medical applications, a large proportion of its sales are for cosmetic or aesthetic uses um, for which animal testing should not be permitted. And we know that when it comes to the regulator deciding whether to permit these tests, they don't necessarily know at that point what the Botox is going to be used for. Um, so that's a really big issue with Botox testing, um, but it's not going to be what I'll focus on today. Um, because the rat list is about tests with replacements and we know that a robust replacement for the animal method has been available since the early 2010s and this is the cell-based assay. So just to give you a bit of a snapshot over time, um, this is the number of uses of mice for Botox testing in Great Britain from 2018 to 2021. So as I mentioned, we do actually have exact figures, um, I believe for 2018, 2019. And you can see that there were really tens of thousands of mice used, oh sorry, tens of thousands of uses of mice in these tests for those years. So it does appear that the uses are falling gradually, um, but not quickly enough. Considering that the cell-based assay has been around for over 10 years, these tests really shouldn't be taking place at all. So yeah, it's, it's good that it's going down, but the fact that there's still over 50,000 each year is not good enough. So to what extent is global harmonization the issue? As in, are these tests being conducted to meet the requirements of an overseas regulator? Well, there was an interesting answer to a parliamentary question back in 2022 that said that the Botox animal test is still conducted where there's not a validated non-animal alternative acceptable to the relevant regulator. So this obviously piqued our interest. We thought, aha, who's the relevant regulator in this situation? So through a freedom of information request, we found out the answer. In 2021, all of the assumed Botox tests were conducted to meet EU requirements. So surely this means the relevant regulator is the European Medicines Agency. So why might the European Medicines Agency not accept the non-animal replacement test? This seems kind of puzzling because when you look to the relevant regulation or guidance, which is in this case, the European Pharmacopeia, 
we can see that the Botox monograph was updated recently and that this update included clear language about the use of the cell-based assay. So you might think, okay, these stats are from 2021 and before, maybe this update came a little bit too late and we'll see changes in the next few years. I think that's possible, but even prior to the 2022 update, replacement and refinements were still permitted. Although admittedly, the language around them was a bit more vague and confusing. So I think it's possible that this 2022 update to the um, monograph in the European Pharmacopeia could have a really positive impact and it could result in less animal use. Unfortunately, however, the pharmacopoeia still describes the mouse assay as the reference standard, and the cell-based assay is discussed in a really superficial way compared with the level of detail that the monograph goes into about the mouse assay. So there's actually still loads of room for improvement. So what can we say about why the test is still taking place? Well, even though um, the tests were conducted to meet the requirements of EU legislation, I don't think global harmonization is really the issue here, because when we looked into it, we realized that the European pharmacopoeia actually still applies in Great Britain. So even though the tests are being conducted, say, for the product to be marketed in the EU, actually, we have the same standards. So there's no reason that, you know, the same test wouldn't take place if it was being marketed in the UK or Great Britain. So even though the monograph in the pharma, uh, European pharmacopoeia could be better, as I said, it could be clearer about using the cell-based assay, I don't think it's necessarily an issue that it's an unclear regulation or guideline. I think that monograph is actually pretty clear that you can use the cell-based assay when it's been validated. I think the issue here is actually lack of product-specific validation. So unfortunately, because the mouse test is still the reference standard, the cell-based assay has to be validated with respect to the mouse test by every individual manufacturer for every individual product. When we were still in the EU, the European Commission said that companies should undertake this validation exercise in a reasonable time. But there's actually no real motivation, either carrot or stick, for companies to actually do this exercise. So combined with a lack of intervention from the authorities to make sure that manufacturers are conducting this validation, I think the lack of product specific validation is the issue that's leading to tens of thousands of mice still suffering in these tests each year. So we have ideas about how to accelerate the process. Um, for example, one of our ideas is making sure that medicines regulators require manufacturers of new Botox products to validate the cell based assay before they're allowed onto the market. And we're working on getting these ideas implemented. So it's a, a bit of an unsatisfying ending, uh, but I would say watch this space. So zooming out for a second here, not just focusing on the Botox test, but on the rat list as a whole, we also use the rat list to educate and lobby. Um, so it's on our Cruelty Free International website to educate the public and anybody who's interested. We use it internally to inform and direct campaigns. And we also use it to support lobbying activities. So for example, uh, we presented the EU rat list to the member states' national contact points for the directive um, in 2021, basically to demonstrate that these tests were still taking place and to hold the member states to account and ask them why these tests are still happening in their countries. And um, for example, France still uses a lot of animals in a really cruel method of antibody production called the ascites method. So we were able to speak to the French representative and ask them directly why this was still happening, kind of armed with the facts and figures that the rat list gives us. So finally, future plans for the rat list. Well, we'll continue to grow and develop the rat list based on animal use figures and scientific progress. It's certainly not a static document. It's more of a kind of living document and an ongoing project, project where we'll remove tests that are no longer conducted so, for example, if we find in 2022 that there are zero skin irritation tests, then that test will come off of the UK rat list. Um, but of course, we'll still keep an eye on it, on that kind of test to make sure it doesn't resurge again in the future. And we'll also keep an eye on what's quickly becoming replaceable, for example, the fish acute toxicity test. So OECD guidelines for the um, fish embryo test and fish cell line acute toxicity test uh, are now available. 
And I would say we're on the cusp of saying these methods are valid, widely accepted replacements. We're probably not quite there yet, but the minute that we're there, um, that, that test will be going on onto the rat list. And we'll continue to use the rat list to highlight, track, educate and lobby. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, if you want to get in touch, that's my email address. Feel free to check out our website, follow us on Twitter. And I've just added a few further reading links of interesting stuff you can look at um, if you like the subject. So thank you very much. Let me see how I can look at people again. OK. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or just turn your mic on and go ahead and ask. I'll just give everyone a couple more minutes, well, maybe another minute, just in case you're formulating a question and haven't quite got there yet. Well, thanks for the nice comments, Kathy and Toba. What do you think the next? Okay, thank you, Emily. That's a really good question. Let me just see if I can see this properly. What do you think the next test on the rat list to be replaced will be? I, I think it will be probably fish acute toxicity um, because I think the methods are scientifically there. Um, I think we're in a position where we can use the cell assay, um, cell line assay and the fish embryo toxicity test, particularly if they're used together in a weight of evidence kind of approach. Um, and I believe there is an IATA that's being developed for fish acute toxicity to kind of um, guide how to use different approaches together. But yeah, I think we're really close with fish acute toxicity, which will be fantastic because it uses a lot of animals every year. Um, even though each single test doesn't use that many animals, it's, it's conducted a lot and it's a really severe test as well. So it, it uses death as the endpoint for the fish involved. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really close one. And, I'm very excited for the time when that can be replaced. Um, Ash says, why are inspectors not recommending replacements? Uh, according to the NC3R's report, the reason is that they don't have the depth of knowledge in every single field that they cover to know to recommend replacements. And this isn't a criticism of the inspectors it's that it's not humanly possible for an, you know, there's not that many home office inspectors. They have to cover every single field that animals are used in, in this country. Um, you know, covering multiple, each inspector covers multiple topics. They have loads of projects that they have to review and they just don't have the depth of knowledge to be able to recommend replacements. That's the issue. So there are, there are various steps in the process. So, um, there's review by the, the funder, usually, um, if it's the kind of research that is funded by a funding body. And um, there's review by the AWERB, which is the local ethical review body within the establishment. And there's the review by the inspector. And according to the report, the a neither the AWERB nor the inspector has the depth of knowledge. The funder might have the depth of knowledge, but they don't really have the legal obligation um, to suggest replacements. Um, so yeah, there's there's just no, the checks and balances just aren't in place, unfortunately, but definitely check out that report. I found it kind of mind blowing. Uh, Jeff says, how can the overseas versus UK requirement, yeah, how can the overseas, blah, how can the overseas versus UK requ requirements be addressed? I think my mouth stopped working. Um, yeah, this is a really good question. And I, I think it's really shocking. That, uh, so, for example, if a skin sensitization test was required 
for a chemical, an industrial chemical that was being registered in the US, um, it could well be required to be conducted on a guinea pig for the US, whereas here in the UK, the non-animal method would be accepted. And I believe that the, um, the Home Office would authorise in that case. So according to them, they take it on a case by case basis. They will only authorise if they feel that there's a good justification for conducting the animal test. But I would argue that if we as a society have said we no longer want to conduct the animal test for that purpose because we don't believe it's justified, we shouldn't be doing that for overseas regulators either. Um, so I, I don't know how we can address this. Um, it's a kind of a work in progress. It's something that's definitely on our radar and that we want to kind of engage more with the Home Office on. Um, if anyone has any ideas, they're very welcome to share them. Thanks, Jeff. Right, let's see. Oops, a little... Ah, thanks, Monique. And Jeff says, thank you. Okay, I think that's all the questions unless... Please, please shout if I've missed yours. Just scanning the chat now to make sure. Okay, yeah, I think, I think I've got them all. But um, thank you so much for your attention and for being really engaged and for asking brilliant questions. I really appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. And yeah, okay, take care. Now I need to actually figure out how to end the call because I don't know how to do that. Okay, thank you everybody. Bye.